in a series that we're calling right now. We're calling it the Church on Mission. And, uh, and what does it mean after last week's celebration of Pentecost where, where we recognize that the Holy Spirit is at work and moving around us? What does that mean to us? How are we supposed to be behaving different? How are we transformed by those experiences? That's what we're, we're into and that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to start by way of 1982. Um, you might remember 1982. Um, Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands in 1982. E.T. was the number one movie in 1982. Richard Greer, Gear, sorry, I always butcher his name, became famous for his role in An Officer and a Gentleman in 1982. All three of those things are useless bits of trivia that Team Bazinga apparently would have known at Trivia Night because they nailed it um, and we had a great time. So yay, Team Bazinga. Just for the record, the Millers are still undefeated because I wasn't on any team. Um, and so when we do this again, I know who to watch out for or whose table I should sit at, um, as the case may be. So anyway, um, but I'll tell you what else was happening in 1982. In 1982, I happened to be in Mr. Jets, uh, uh, Jensen's fifth grade class at Jefferson Elementary School in Pullman, Washington. Now, i got to tell you about Mr. Jensen. Mr. Jensen was one of those teachers that, that embedded a memory in me. He actually probably embedded a couple, but, but one memory in particular. <clears throat> and I'm going to share it with you right now. He really wanted to emphasize the value of creative writing. Um, he would read to the class, actually. Um, he, his, his favorite book series was the, the, um, not the Chronicles of Narnia. They were the Pride Ear Chronicles. Um, it doesn't matter. He would read them, and he had a different facial expression for each character, and he just wanted to instill that sense of creativity and literature in his class. And so part of what he would do is, is he would, uh, uh, during the course of the week, he would give the students an hour to do creative writing. And it was supposed to be a quiet time where you just sat at your desk or you could go find someplace comfortable in the room and you could, you could write. And so what he would do is he would let that happen for a few days at a time and then he would invite students at random to come up and read their creative writing stories. And, and I still have vivid memories of a couple of the kids um, that had just really, really great stories and, and, uh, and voices because they were mimicking him and, and facial expressions. One kid who, who always tried to make things as gross as possible. Well, I, I was supposed to, of course, be participating because I was in the class, right? Um, but, you know, I, I kind of enjoyed that time to just, you know, pause and reflect and... Uh, well, you know, not do what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> well, the day came. You know the day was coming. The day came when, when he asked a student to come up and read, and they read their story, and everybody applauded at the end. And then Mr. Jensen, sitting at his desk, said, Bill Miller, I looked down at my page. The opening line, once upon a time. That was all that was on the page. He was calling me out. Oh gosh, what do I do? I can't admit that I haven't done anything for like three weeks. So I pick up my page and I start walking towards the podium. I have no idea what I'm doing. I get up there and this look of terror is on my face. There's no doubt in my mind about it. And I look at him and he gives me this really hard, suspicious look. I put the page down. I look at my class, my peers, my friends in front of me. I look down again and I say... Once upon a time, and then I went. I went for a solid 10 minutes, and I told the most amazing story that's ever been told. At least this is my memory of it. People laughed, people cried, they gasped at the right spots. It was wonderful, this great, great story. And then I get to the final bit of it, and I say, the end. And I smile, and I get an applause too. Wow, this is great, but here's the deal. You're supposed to turn your reading assignment into the teacher when you're done. And while I was in fifth grade and maybe not the brightest kid in this class, I was also smart enough to realize that I had not looked down at my page once and somebody had to have noticed. Mr. Jensen surely did. I pick up my page and I walk over. I remember he's to the left. I walk over towards his desk. That look of fear and terror that had been before returned rapidly. And as I approached, he looked at me really, really hard. I get all the way to the desk, 
and I offer up my page, knowing that this is it for me. And he looks at me straight in the eyes and says, go sit down, Bill. And he let me keep my page. Now, for a split, split second, I was a fifth grader, and I'm still kind of not that bright. For a split second, I thought, did I get away with it? No, I did not. And I knew that I didn't when I just gave it more than a split second. He showed me a measure of grace in that moment. And, uh, um, and I can assure you that I did get called again. And when I did get called, I had my page full and a true manuscript to go with the story I told. But, but my reason for bringing this up is, is he, if I were to stop and, and, and put a list of the 10 most influential people in my life, the mentors that brought me the furthest, Mr. Jensen might not make that list. But you know what? I know his name. And he did make a difference, made a difference in the journey of my life, and it's those little differences that really, really matter. And when we think about our journey of faith, our journey of faith oftentimes is not because of these big, tremendous moments um, that then last with a mentor that walks us for, for months and years at a time. Sometimes the good news is not dispensed, believe it or not, by the charisma of a few individuals. But the gospel is ultimately spread by those who are committed and obedient within the entire body of Christ. We all have a role in each other's lives and in the lives of the people around us. And it's with that in mind that we're going to be looking today at the book of Acts. We're going to be in in chapter 9. So if you have your Bible or if you're online, you can go get it. Um, We're headed to chapter 9, but... I'm going to set the stage up for for just a second. In chapter 7, we have um, the first martyr uh, of the faith, and that was Stephen. Stephen, by the way, was not an apostle. He was one of the identified to be a deacon. He was was kind of where the rubber meets the road, serving people, and he finds himself in front of the, the, um, the Jewish authorities, and he ends up giving a very, very passionate defense of the faith. <clears throat> and, um, and as it all culminates... The, uh, the Jewish leaders are absolutely appalled and they drag Stephen out and they stone him to death. This is a big deal because you might recall that, that Jesus was crucified because the Jews were not legally allowed to execute anyone. Only the Romans could do that. So what we have here really is, is vigilante justice on the part of the Jews. They're, they're that wound up. They drug Stephen out and stoned him on the spot. No due process of any kind to speak of. And so, so things are going south within the, uh, the community there in Jerusalem in a big way. And, and we read this um, towards the beginning of chapter 8. It says that a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So the, the deal was, um, if you were identified as a Christian, there was no safety for you in government because the, the, uh, the Jewish authorities were running rogue and taking people out is what it came down to. And the very, very opening line of chapter 8 refers us to a specific individual. Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. So we're introduced to Saul for the very first time in chapter 8. Chapter 8 goes on to not talk about Saul at all. It takes us on a different journey, and then we find ourselves setting the stage for our reading today at the beginning of of chapter 9. At the beginning of chapter 9, Saul, who is kind of on board with what's happening, has gotten really, really wound up, and he's decided that he wants to be a part of this whole vigilante thing. And so he he ends up getting permission from the the Jewish authorities to go to Damascus to start rounding up Jews, or rounding up Christians, male or female, to bring them back in chains. And given the circumstances, you wonder how many he actually planned to bring back with him. Let's be really, really clear. Saul is a bad, bad guy. And that brings us to where we're going to pick up in verse 3, where we read this. As he was approaching Damascus on his mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. 
And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. So here, Saul, who who just a moment ago was extremely confident in what he was doing, absolutely convinced that he was doing God's will by rounding up these heretics that were threatening to dismantle the Jewish religion. And all of a sudden, God shows up in a very, very powerful way with very little explanation. Think about that for just a minute. He identifies himself, and he says, now go and wait. And that's what Saul's required to do. He goes to Damascus where he waits for three days, blind and not eating or drinking. He's fasting while he's trying to figure out what the heck just happened. Maybe, he might be thinking to himself, maybe I've got something wrong here. We pick up at verse 10. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias, that's you, (laughs) coming and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias has this vision, and Ananias knows exactly who Saul is. He's a little bit concerned because maybe he's thinking God hasn't quite heard of him yet. <laughs> and, but of course God has, and God doesn't, doesn't challenge Ananias. He just says, I have a plan. And what does Ananias do? Well, that's verse 17. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. So, So here we have Ananias, who who just presents himself humbly, goes and finds Saul, and, and, and think about the humility in this too. Knowing who Saul is, knowing the threat, knowing that he is not a good man at all, Ananias calls him Brother Saul. God says, I'm supposed to be trusting you or at least uh, trusting in him that you're going to be okay, or this is all going to work out somehow, but that you're called to a purpose. So that means you must be a brother. So he calls him Brother Saul. And then I like what happens next. The, the scales fall from his eyes, and he's baptized. And he's baptized first. Then he gets about to eating and drinking and catching up on his diet. Um, it's this kind of a thing of priorities that, that God sends Ananias to, to deliver this message, this peace, and, and this healing. And then that healing continues after the scales fall and he's baptized. So he got, now he can see, now he can experience the Holy Spirit, now he's, he's being fed, and then he stays with the disciples in Damascus, it says, a few days. And you got to believe that during that time, they... They were talking to him. Now, now we know uh, as, as we came to know or come to know Saul, and later we call him Paul, um, he knew his Old Testament scriptures really, really well. Um, he was very well educated, and so it probably didn't take much for, for the team there 
to help him bridge the gap between the book knowledge that he had to the truth of Jesus Christ. Um, but it did take those people. Ananias is a, is a pretty key player in all of this. Now, now Saul and this story of his conversion, we sometimes fixate on it. Um, we got to remember, though, that this is actually just one of three conversion stories that all happen all in short proximity to one another. Four, if you want to be creative in your math. The first was actually in chapter 8. In chapter 8, as we read along um, after it said that the Christians were being persecuted, um, Philip is one of, the, uh, <clears throat> one of the team, and he's out there, and he comes across an Ethiopian eunuch. And he ends up sharing the good news with him and, and bringing the man to Christ. And, and you got to understand the context here. This first conversion of, of somebody, this guy is a foreigner and he's a eunuch. So, so eunuchs in the first century, not a pleasant thing. These were um, individuals that were identified um, usually prepubescent and they were physically altered so that they could no longer be a threat to someone's harem or, or the court women. And so this means that their maturity, physically speaking, was stunted. These were different people. So this guy is a foreign and a bit weird. Um, but guess what? Philip has no problem sharing the good news with him. The next conversion is Saul himself, chapter 9. And let's be clear about who Saul is. Again, a violent enemy to all Christians. Not on your big list of people to go share the gospel with. But he is conversion story number two. Conversion story number three is in the very next chapter, and it's Cornelius, a Roman captain in charge of what was called the Italian Regiment. Um, he's, a, he's a Roman soldier who represents everything that the people of Palestine were opposed to. These are the occupiers, the oppressors. And guess what? He calls for Peter, and he ends up accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, along with everybody in his house. So we have these three conversion stories, and all three of them are unlikely targets for people to accept the good news of Jesus Christ. The fourth one is the bonus conversion, and it happens there in chapter 10 and 11. Um, it's, with, uh, it's with Peter himself. You know, Peter believed that the gospel was supposed to be just for the people of Israel, for the Jews, but his heart is converted to recognize that, no, this message is for a whole lot more than just that. Um, now Saul, Saul would go on to be Paul, and he would have a mission very specific to the Gentiles. He would be the Paul that we talk about when we think about the Bible, a prolific writer. He wrote the majority of what we call the New Testament now, um, a big deal and a big wheel. And his story is a story of, of privilege and power in his youth. He came from a wealthy family. He was extremely well educated, but he gives that all up for humility and obedience to Jesus Christ. It's an amazing story, and we could spend a whole lot of time with it. But I'm more interested in the other guy that was in that conversion story, Ananias. Ananias had every reason you could imagine to say no to God. And they fall into basically two categories. The first one is a great big capital F, fear. Fear. Saul's a bad guy. You are asking me to expose myself as a Christian to a guy whose job right now it is to round up Christians and probably execute them. And you want me to expose my identity to him. And you could imagine that, that his fear is, is even deeper than himself because, wait a minute, if they find out that I'm a Christian, they might look to my whole household. They might start networking around me. I might be giving up a whole bunch of people. I am terrified at the idea of compromising um, the Christian community in the city of Damascus right now. And Lord, you're asking me to do that. This is terrifying. It could unravel a whole bunch of things for a whole bunch of people. Oh, fear. It could also have been judgment. Saul's a bad guy. Does he really deserve the good news? I mean, really, come on. If we're, uh, if we're not being honest with ourselves, we know that we have the tendency to do this, right? We, we start doing God's job for him. Heck, that's what got us into trouble in Genesis chapter 3. We like to do God's job for us um, and uh, uh, for ourselves. And so, so, but here it is. You know, maybe, maybe it's possible at some level that, that Ananias could have thought to himself, you know what, this guy, he, we don't need to be sharing this with him. He, he, he doesn't need it. He needs to get what's coming to him. But that's not how it works. 
Ananias does exactly as he's told. And, and I got to believe that, that as, he, as he hunkered down and he shared that message of hope, that, uh, that Paul would never forget who Ananias was. I shared this scripture passage with y'all a couple of months ago, but I want to come back to it. This is, this is from Paul's letter to the Romans. It's in chapter 10, and beginning at verse 9. And, and Paul writes this. He says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They all have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can anyone call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone, um, yeah, how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scripture says, How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. I gotta believe that as Paul was writing that line, he was thinking about Ananias. And apparently he has beautiful feet too. Um, Really think about that for a moment. That that Paul the Apostle recognizes that, that his relationship with Jesus Christ was ultimately facilitated by a human. A human sent by God. Remember the scene. God shows up makes his identity known, but then really says nothing to Saul except go and wait. The rest of the story unfolds because of who God called to go and minister to Saul. And that's the deal for each and every one of us. We are called to be Ananias. Now listen, the Pauls in this world are important, but But the deal is, we need more people who choose to be Ananias. Here's the the crisis for us. According to to researchers here in the United States, 86% of people who worship Christ will tell you that they were invited to church the first time by a friend or family member. 86%. They were not attracted to the church because of charismatic teaching or of great worship sets, but it was about people who ended up in a relationship with another. People become followers when they realize the truth and joy of Jesus Christ, and that real relationship with Jesus is more often than not facilitated by a relationship that they have with somebody who is a follower of Jesus Christ already. We are called to be in relationship with others and to share what it is we know with other people. Now, teaching and worship is very, very important. It's the fruit of what happens when you gather believers together and there is something exciting and powerful about it. But the people come to the room not because of what's happening at one end of the room or the other, but because we go out and share the good news. But there is a crisis in our culture And it is a crisis of culture, our lack of invitation culture, you might say. Um, The fastest growing Christian faith communities in America um, were were identified by some researchers. Uh, um, The Assemblies of God are actually the fastest growing kind of sect within Christianity growing in America. And and those who are along the Pentecostal ring. And when surveyed, it said that they discovered that 71% of those Church members that go to those churches, 71% will say that they regularly invite people to church. In contrast, the uh, slowest growing faith communities, there's a list of them, um, and there's a name that ends up on the list, Lutheran. It's got nothing to do with the name, it's got to do with the culture. Less than 55% of people in that category, churches, church members in that category, said that they would be willing, willing to invite somebody to church, but parenthetically it says, but rarely do. We're called to be Ananias. We're called to go out and share this good news, but but why, why is it that we don't? Well, I think the list is similar to Ananias's. 
fear. Fear. We're, we're afraid of exposing ourselves, admitting that we are Christians. And you know what? This, this just could lead to lost opportunities, some, some form of persecution. Gosh, do I, do I really want to experience that? Or, as I uh, highlighted earlier, maybe it's judgment. Maybe we're thinking to ourselves, ah, I don't think that person would fit in here, Lord. I mean, they don't dress right. They don't act right. They don't vote right. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and so all of a sudden, we're screening people out. But I think if we're really thinking about it, the real reason is fear of judgment. We are afraid of how we are going to be judged. We might be thinking to ourselves, oh gosh, what will they think of me? Will they like me less? Will they avoid me and stop sharing things with me? And if you listen to that list just now, there was a whole lot of me's in it because suddenly we've got something wrong going in our minds. Rick Warren writes a very famous book that you probably all have heard of, The Purpose Driven Life. And the opening line of that book is awesome. It says, It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. And Ananias understood that. Faced with the challenge, being called to do something where he was going to be accepting tremendous risk to himself and to the people he loved, he remembered, wait a minute, Jesus first, others second, you last. He remembered that. If we want others to worship with us on the mountain of God, like Ananias, we have to be prepared to walk into the darkest, deepest, scariest parts of the valley to go share the good news with them. And that's how it happens. And that is God's mission. God's mission is to bring people into a real, genuine relationship with him. And the mission of the church, the church on mission, is to be God's primary tool in making that happen. We get the privilege of being Ananias. And that is our call, to pray to be like Ananias. And you know what? Just like we sang at the beginning, Ananias' name is, well, we find it in chapter 9. That's it. But he, he ends up being the key figure that leads to Saul becoming Paul, to so many of us knowing faith. That's the privilege and the call for each of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you had the power to change Saul's heart, and we know that you can change our hearts as well. We all live in a world where where everyone is hearing promises that come from the world, but really the truth is the world just leaves us empty. And it is only you that can satisfy the, the hunger and thirst that we so desperately need. But first we need to Let the scales fall from our eyes and we need to be humble enough to to serve you and be a part of letting the scales fall from the eyes of others. So that's our prayer for us today, Lord, that we may have the courage, like Ananias, to be your servants and to to deliver your message of hope and joy. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.